Hello again, folks, in 114. Today we're going to be covering section 8.3. Here's the calendar. <clears throat> Today is Wednesday, uh, June 16th. It's my sister's birthday, actually. Um, so we'll be covering 8.3 in Harano. <laughs> nah. Um, I should get mad if I said that, actually. Uh, anyhow, um... The packet I have for you consists of this page. This is an overview, so I like to do, of uh, different uh, measurements according to the dimension. Um, here is, although it's in black and white, your copy would be color. This, These are the formulas that are relevant to section A3. So I would definitely print that, um, unless you have them memorized. And then there are the word problems. I didn't leave the solutions, I'm gonna go through these entirely. They are in the book if you absolutely need them. There's a diagram for one of them. Okay, and I think that is it. All right, so print that and we'll go over it. If you're following along. And then we'll start the show here. Beach you. First things first. All right. Um, let's say that we organize measurements according to dimension. Right. Um, this chapter is uh, about perimeters, areas, and volumes. So depending upon which one you're looking for, also surface area. Um, depending upon what you're looking for. All right, we'll, let's consider these as one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional. There is, in theory, a fourth dimension, time, but that's the subject of a physics class. Um, and yeah, I made these little pictures here uh, to add to this. Let's start with something that is simple, one-dimensional, uh, intuitively. A distance, you know, there's lots of names for this, of course, when you're reading um, uh, a drawing. Um, in alternative to the word distance, you might see um, side to be very general, or length, um, or width, or height, or depth. I think that is a comprehensive list of alternative phrases. Right? There's a distance. Well, it's referring to the, di the space, and I shouldn't say space, the distance, the length between one point and another point. Now, I specifically made this red here as to kind of indicate that this is where I start looking. You don't have to, in theory, it wouldn't matter. There's no up, there's no down. But uh, let's just stick with the idea of reading from left to right. So, uh, this, the distance between two points, all right? is um, on, a, on a straight line, right, is just regarded as a distance. And if it were part of some shape, say, for example, to distinguish one distance from another, they might use words like length or width instead of referring to sides. Right? Side implies that it's part of a shape. Distance is more general than that. All right. If you go down a wee bit here, technically what is also a one-dimensional measurement would be a perimeter or a circumference. And here's what I would suggest. Um, the outcome is most certainly one dimensional, right? Usually you're looking for a perimeter around a two dimensional shape though, right? The shape itself may be two dimensional, but the measurement ultimately is one dimensional. It's more or less translating something from 2D to 1D. You can think, about, think of it like that, right? I put certain things in red here to draw some emphasis. So let me just kind of scoot this a little further away back. What's in purple is the concept that is important to know by name. What is in red here is maybe a good way, you know, 
crunch down to a single word to remember the concept. What is the distance? It's between two points, right? What is the perimeter or circumference in theory, which is pertaining to circles? That is around a bunch of points. You might say points in a circuit, because they have to complete. Where you start is where you end, ultimately, if you're talking about a real true perimeter or circumference, right? As I said, the shapes that you measure a perimeter are two-dimensional. Um, even a circle, the outcome would be expressed two-dimensional, right? How could you tell? Um, uh, the, the shape itself is two-dimensional, but the measurement is one-dimensional. So although nobody bothers to write the exponent, whatever the unit is, inches, centimeters, or what have you, it would be degree one. Um, in keeping with this idea concept, maybe an easy way or a helpful way to remember it, an area is the amount of inside, right? A two-dimensional shape. This is under the column heading of, again, 2D. Just as volume, as you can see, is under the column heading of 3D. Right? Inside what, though? You have to be very careful. No one would get mad at you, and they really shouldn't derate you either. <laughs> um, but it's inside a plane, you know, a flat two-dimensional shape, all right? A surface is really what this is referred to as. In ordinary conversation, you will hear people say, well, especially a student will come up to you as a teacher, and they will say, uh, do you want me to get the space inside, you know? And you have to go, yeah, you know, because you know what they mean. But then make sure that you, you know, add to that, you know, a little addendum. Tell them, reserve the word space for things that are 3D. Right. Reserve, use the word surface instead when you're referring to something that is two-dimensional as in the case of areas. Right. So 3D space is the inside, uh, 2D surface is the inside. Right. The inside points in a plane, in the arrangement of a plane. Right. There is this other thing though, there's surface area. All right. um, these are points, you might say, on an object. So, like before, if perimeter is basically starting with something that's two-dimensional and forming a one-dimensional measurement, right? Uh, surface area is more or less starting with something that is three-dimensional and translating that to a two-dimensional measurement, right? All right, the measurement is two-dimensional. Right? If you have a, an area of any sort, even if it's an area of a bunch of sides added together, the unit, whatever it is, centimeters or so forth, inches, all right, it would be degree two, and then they would definitely be obligated to write that. Okay, To illustrate um, that in this instance you're more concerned with the, um, the on, the portions, uh, the surfaces on the shape, I tried to make them different colors. You know? They're, you know, uh, somewhat uh, semi-transparent, you know, sort of translucent. Um, but uh, you would basically be just finding the area of the bottom, the top, the two sides, the back and the front. All right? If you're talking about a surface area of, say, a rectangle, the solid. All right? Then there's volume. All right? Volume is a three-dimensional measurement. Let's take this forward hand. And again, uh, a word uh, to uh, summarize the idea, right? It is a measure of the inside somehow, but it's the inside of a space, right? Points that are in a space or forming a space, part of a space, right? Um, again, try to reserve, especially as a teacher, try to reserve the word space, and not everybody knows what you mean when you use it out of context, uh, for things that are 3D and surface for things that are 2D. All right. Um, let's see. And in that case, uh, the unit that you'd be left with, all right, whatever the dimensions are here, here, and here, they would be degree three. Okay. So that's how I've organized it. All right. What is truly three-dimensional? A volume, an area and uh, is truly two-dimensional and a distance is truly one-dimensional, right? When you have these situations, they're a little bit more complicated than that because you are talking about a 3D object in this instance, and you are talking about a two-dimensional uh, item, 
all right? But the measurements themselves are more or less a translation. This is one dimension. This is one dimension in a different orientation. This is one dimension in a different orientation. This is a one dimension in a different orientation. It's more or less, again, translating these different orientations into, you know, one stretched out distance, you know? If you can imagine this as being segments that you then link up together, all right? Think about it that way, all right? You translated a circuit path into a linear path, all right? All right, the measurement is one dimensional. Surface area is the measurement is two dimensional, all right? What are you doing really? Um, the basic gist of perimeter or circumference is you're adding a lot. Um, similarly, the surface area, all right? You're adding areas. In this case, you're adding um, distances or segments. Right. When you calculate an area by itself, each individual area, all right, what are you doing? You're multiplying in cases like this. All right. Same thing for volume, multiplying by three dimensions as opposed to two dimensions. Now, when it comes to something like circumference, because you can calculate a circumference, it's more or less a perimeter of a circle and an area of the circle as well. There is a formula that you must incorporate pi. All right? In that instance, you, you are multiplying. All right. All right. Now, um, let's get into it. Uh, let me just quickly flash the... Uh, overview of the formulas. Again, I would definitely print this page. Because this is a very nice summary of formulas based upon the shape that you're working with. If you work with a, a triangle, you are subject to the use of these formulas. Alright, now it didn't erase at all. Okay. Um, here. <clears throat> A triangle, you could calculate its perimeter. It's adding the side here to the side here to the side here. And in that case, they may just designate these as subscript 1, subscript 2, subscript 3. Right? A label, not an operation. It just so happens that subscript 3 is the base, ordinarily. Right? If you're calculating an area of a triangle, um, it's half times this dimension, base, and height dimension. It just so happened, turns out that a triangle is always half of a rectangle. But they've just changed the labels from L and W to B and H, more or less. If you have a square, due to the nature of a square uh, being all equal sides, rather than add, which you could do, add the sides one after another, it would be more efficient to multiply. So when you're calculating a perimeter in that instance, you could just, you know, multiply by 4 rather than do S plus S plus S plus S. All right, if you're calculating an area, you just need two dimensions, as you would famously length times width in the case of a rectangle, but there's no reason to give them different labels, right, because they're the same number here and here. So S squared, all right, the instruction as an exponent. Rectangles are famously length times width. If you have a perimeter, oh, pardon me, a Parallel dimensions here of length, you can multiply by two, it's more efficient. If you have parallel dimensions of width here, you could again multiply by two because it's more efficient. And then add as an afterthought. Overall, I mean, as long as you get the concept of perimeter down pat, you could mm, calculate the perimeter of anything that has actual sides. All right. Uh, because as a circle does not regard it, is not regarded as having a side, even though it has that edge. All right, because it's not flat. Anything with flat sides, just add indefinitely if you need to. Here's the formula for a parallelogram, um, which is the labeling of which is what the area formula for a triangle derives from base times height. This is a base, this is a height. Again, if you're calculating 
um, the perimeter, these dimensions W would be diagonal line here. You could multiply by two rather than add. It's more efficient to multiply, right? Trapezoid. This is something I was alluding to yesterday. Right. A trapezoid is regarded as having two bases, which is why you see a base subscript 1 and a base subscript 2. All right. um, again, you could add this side to this base to this side to this base in sequence, and you can get the perimeter. Because again, it's just a circuit around any shape. If you're calculating the area, though, right. it's basically, if you can imagine, um, a parallelogram. Uh, you know, rearrange. You know, if you took this half of it, this little triangle here, and moved it over here, um, it would, you know, fit this shape, like so. Um, or, even better still, if you cut this into halves, then you have. Um, a triangle and then a second triangle that is the second low the picture's not doing any justice. Um, sorry. I'm looking at it at an angle. So it makes my drawing it a little bit crooked. Uh, without being in front of the projection. You cut a parallelogram in half, then you see that you have two uh, triangles. Right. And you can rotate this around. And what you should get is that shape, right? So what is the base? You know, it would be the sum of this base and this base together, right? right? The height dimension is the height dimension. Um, because you cut it in half. I always like to do this, but you know what? Not to get myself in trouble, but there's a, there's a better way to explain it than I'm doing any injustice right now. Um, forgive me, I can't help myself. If I were to draw this nicely, triangles. Right. Here's the height of the triangle. Okay. That's the height dimension. Okay. And if you were just calculating um, this particular triangle, which I will shade like so, right. you could calculate that knowing the height and this particular base. So this would be an area of a base times a height divided by two. Okay. But then you would end up having, of course, a second uh, triangle, which I'm going to highlight. It's upside down, really. And its height dimension is the type that forms a scalene triangle. The height dimension would be red from the outside. So I'm just going to translate this height dimension to the outside here. That's still height. Okay. Sorry. And the actual base would be from here to here. So if you can imagine the secondary triangle here, this would be a red triangle. is its own base, base 1 times the same height divided by 2. Now, being that you have an area that is comprised of two triangles, you would have to add the areas. So area 1 added to area 2. And by virtue of the fact that they have common features, they both have the common factor of a height dimension that is the same, 
and uh, they're both essentially being divided by two, multiplied by a half. One could factor those out. So if you look at it this way, B1H over two plus B2 times H over two. Right. If you were to factor it out, the common features, they would sit outside of a parentheses, right? The half could be written on the outside of the parentheses because it's a common feature here and here. Similarly, the H's, right? What would be left behind, the things that they don't have in common, right? The base here and the base here. That's where That's where this comes from. Okay, it's a, a crafty way of basically rearranging the parts. All right. Now, um, down here, more complex, uh, the area and circumference of a circle, respectively. All right. Remember, in the case of circles, especially, let me start with that. You have to incorporate pi, whether you're calculating an area or you're calculating a circumference, and because you're using pi. Now, sacred number that is pi, 3.14159, whatever it is, into infinity. Um, remember that it is irrational. So it, the decimal uh, equivalent would stretch into infinity. And you can't use infinity, really. What you could use is a very high degree of precision of pi. But as soon as you, tr you know, round it, to some particular place. And when you're a little kid, what do they tell you usually? They say, oh, well, round it to here. You know, knock off infinity. That's for practical reasons, right? Um, we are armed with a pi button on our calculator, which it gives us a higher degree of precision. The best advice I can give you um, is this. Hold off multiplying by pi until dead last for as long as you possibly can because you don't want to round intermittently. Right. Avoid rounding pi until last, until the end of the calculation. All right. Sometimes that takes a little bit of strategy unique to the problem where you arrange it so that you can do that, that you can basically round pi dead last. But do try that. In upper level math and say pre-calculus and calculus, a lot of times what they will say, although it is not immediately as satisfying, is they will say, uh, write your answer in terms of pi. So you'll see a fraction in front of pi. All right, or a decimal from the rest of the problem in theory as a coefficient in front of pi. All right, but not the actual decimal itself. All right, why? Because this is pi symbol summarizes all of infinity without seeing it. Right? So it is, in theory, the accurate, correct, true answer, whereas the, something that incorporates the decimal equivalent is an approximate at best. It's not as good. All right. Pythagorean theorem is specifically for right triangles. All right? And it's famously this formula. Um, the sum of the squares of the sides of a right triangle is equal to the hypotenuse squared. In the Wizard of Oz, at the end of the movie, when the scarecrow gets his brain, you know, it's symbolized as the, the wizard gives him a, a diploma, <laughs> college diploma, right? And he, uh, immediately upon receiving the diploma, uh, recites badly the Pythagorean theorem. It doesn't wrong, you know? It says isosceles when you should say right triangle. So I, I can't help but sense that that is some, this sort of a jab at academia, you know, from the movie industry in 1939. Anyhow, it's the sum, two things added, of the squares, things raised to an exponent of two, of the sides, the legs, of a right triangle specifically. It has to have this box here, yeah, the 90 degree angle. It's equal to the hypotenuse dimension is the C, also squared, okay? 
these are, they use the word uh, leg to refer to them. And they're interchangeable, which means that if you prefer, you could have the label switched. You can make this B, you can make that A. It's not going to hurt it. The one thing that is non-negotiable is the hypotenuse. The dimension that is across immediately from this box, right, must be the C value, right? So don't swap that around, right? As with all things with algebra, as long as you have the majority of information, you can rearrange it and you can figure out the missing chunk. So if you have two out of three, that's good. To quote meatloaf, two out of three ain't bad. All right. Who thought I would quote meatloaf today? I didn't. All right. All right. Um, no, enough of that. All right. Um, let's do some examples here. Now, why on earth did I save that? All right. Okay. We're going to uh, practice um, with these word problems provided by the textbook resource. Lacrosse field, field hockey of some persuasion, right? Um, example, uh, Rob wishes to replace the grass that is a sod on a lacrosse field. One pallet of Bethel Farm sod costs $360 and covers 480 square feet. Now, before I go any further, right, remember conversion factors. These are not really the same dimension. You know, this is talking about an area, as you see, it's a square feet. And this is an amount of money, all right? But you can nonetheless treat these as a conversion factor. So I'm just going to reserve this information up here. $360 of sod essentially equals 480 feet squared area. If the area uh, to be covered is a rectangle, all right, draw a simple rectangle with a length of 360 feet, that's just a coincidence, that number, and a width of 220 feet, determine uh, these three parts. All right, the area in total, how many pallets they would need, and the total cost. All right, so let's draw a simple picture. Talking about a rectangle, this is, all, shall we say, a lacrosse rectangle. A picture is worth a thousand words. That is an old adage, right? Uh, somewhat uh, a cliche or hackneyed. But it's true. It summarizes something non-verbally. I didn't have to even write lacrosse rectangle. You probably know what it was. All right. I'm going to label it all right, to set a good example. It's the length of 360 feet. So let's just say that down here. This is 360 feet, and the width here is uh, 228 feet. Sorry, my blue is not behaving today. Come on, blue. Uh -huh. All right. uh, come on, there we go. That's a move, that's nice. All right, good. All right, um, so what do we do? Calculate the area first. If you have this dimension and this dimension known, uh, and looking at the, unless you have it memorized, of course, the formula at length times width for a rectangle, right? You have all the information you need to answer this question. So, doing doing that really quickly, the area would be equal to 360 times 228, right? Feet and feet which means that you're going to get naturally feet squared because an area is a two-dimensional outcome. All right, measurement. All right, now if you actually did the multiplication, what would you get? Um, you should get 82,080 feet squared. 
Let me just verify with the calculator here. All right. Uh, a little bit of light is kind of cool. 360, turn it on for a signal. 228. 360 times 228. 82,080, that's correct, good. All right, so we've answered the first part here. All right, how many pallets of sod uh, does Rob need? All right, well, this is the cost of one pallet, so I actually could add um, another part of this conversion factor here. This is equal to one uh, pallet. One pallet is $360 simultaneously. One pallet is the equivalent of 480 feet squared. All right. So if you wanted to, you could write, uh, just take two out of the three parts again and write them as a ratio. So how many pallets? And this, since we have an area to work with, we're gonna associate these two things together in tandem. All right. um, what are we given to borrow that model? Remember this conversion factor model. Given, multiplied by the conversion factor, equals what you want. Um, 82,080 feet squared is what is now given, we calculated it, right? If I want, number of pallets, I'm going to put that over here, pallets, then the appropriate rigging of the conversion factor, so that there's a, to facilitate the cancellation effect, um, it would require me to put the area as the denominator and the number of pallets up here as the numerator, essentially, the top and the bottom. So that will force me to put a one here because of this relationship and a 480 here. Now, if you do anything intuitively good, God bless you that you have an intuition. And I would never say, tell a kid, fight your intuition. No, all right, start with that. Take it as far as you can, but don't be rigid in that, well, I must do it, you know, blindly. Uh-uh, not a good strategy, all right? This is a system that once you get comfortable with it, it's uh, almost a guarantee, all right? So this unit cancels this unit justifiably. If you treat this like fractions, it would be 82,080. 82, so you have 82,080 here on top, and one times 480 here. And essentially what you're left with is dividing these two numbers. So if you have this still on your screen, 82,080 divide by the relationship of one to 480, and there you see, 171 pallets. Okay. The pallets is 171 pallets. All right, now lastly, the cost of sod to purchase, more or less the total without saying the word total, right? You're gonna take this conversion factor, right? And use this much of it. You've calculated the number of pallets. One, uh, the relationship is 171, but the relationship is one to $360. So if you're given now 171 pallets and you multiply strategically by this relationship, $360 for one pallet Rigging it so, the unit, the you know, weird unit of a pallet cancels here and here, because this is above the line and that's below the line. It's more or less dividing without consciously thinking of it. And then you're just left with ones as the bottom, which is superfluous, you don't need it. And it's just a matter of 171 times 360. That is the justification for it. All right, so you take 171, and you multiply by 360, and then you have it. 61,560. Yep. So, 
$61,560 is what it would cost. That's quite hefty to price tag, right? <laughs> Alright, so not too bad, right? Right. We're relying as we walk as we should. When when you teach the subject of mathematics, think about it like Apex Technical Schools from back in the day, you know, which was a, if you're not familiar, it was a commercial local a mechanics trade school. Um, they give you the tools, right? That is the way it should be taught, right? The techniques that we have, right? The foundational information is integral, right? People may scoff at it, say, oh, it's all baby math, baloney. There's no such thing as baby math, right? There's fundamental information and it can't be glossed, glossed over, right? Glossed, glossed. And, you know, so take the time, especially when you have little kids, right? Make sure that they know their fundamental facts, right? It's imperative. Right. In this case, the fundamental fact is the area formula, the rectangle, or that this we have this idea of converting between any type of unit. You know, you can make a conversion fact out of any two things. Right. It's quite a paradigm, really, when you give it a thought. All right. Now let me clean up the gobbledygook and move on. You're not teaching a kid to get the answer. You're teaching them how to think. That is the most important thing, how to be rational. Okay. Um, the second question is about a moat. Here we go, that's cute, right? I hope there's not too much glare. Let's see if that helps. Oh yes, that's okay. block it. Alright. Here we go. Here is Castle von Ziegler. Right. Don't storm us, we'll storm you. Okay. Um, and what you see here, though it isn't highlighted, I will do that now, is the shape coming into resolution. Assuming a castle uh, facade is a perfectly vertical line. Um, that forms a right triangle. Okay. This is a right triangle, which means that if necessary, we can employ the area of a triangle, any type of triangle, can, you can calculate its area. Uh, but if it's right specifically, and one could assume that, right. generally, you know, it's not like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you know, the sides of the castle walls here are perfectly vertical and perpendicular to the ground, all right? So you could use the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. All right, now let's read it. The moat surrounding a castle is 18 feet wide. Right. And, sorry for the scribble here. The wall of the moat, the wall by the moat of the castle is 24 feet high. Thank you for illustrating. If an invading army, <laughs> wishes to use a ladder to cross the moat and reach the top of the wall, how long must the ladder be? If they extend the ladder from the uh, edge of the moat here to the very tippy top of the castle here, all right, it's a diagonal line, right? So essentially, what have they done? They're forming, again, um, a right triangle, just to emphasize here, and its dimensions are 18 by 24. Okay, so let's label it. I like to label it this way. Again, if this is a leg of a right triangle, and this is a leg of a right triangle, and you can interchange those, then you can change their labels. My logic is that this is the bottom, so let's just call that B. And just to give it some kind of logic, let's call this an altitude, A. So I'll put um, 24 in the formula here. <clears throat> and 18 in the formula here. Don't die now. <clears throat> Again, the one thing that is non-negotiable is the dimension always across, directly across from the box. The hypotenuse, which is called C always, all right, that's not interchangeable with anything else. All right, so um, that's what we're looking for. Right. So 
being that we have all of the information that we need, all right, it's just a matter of following the order of operations correctly. All right. um, you could rearrange this one step further. Yeah, let me show you something interesting. If you take this C squared one step further, um, that would uh, basically get you to the point of answering the question truly, which is to have it degree one C rather than degree two, which is what the formula gives you. All right. Most of your attention, again, is just following the order of operations here, which is to square first and then add second. But, all right, and you could do that now immediately, and there's no sin in that, but if you want, you could uh, do what, what you'll eventually have to do, which is to um, simplify C squared down to just C degree one. And you do so by opposite operations. What is the opposite of squaring? Square root. So if in theory you've uh, performed the opposite operation known as a square root here for this cancellation effect, essentially, you're obligated to do the same thing to the opposite side, as always the case with solving algebraically. So in this instance, you're going to square first, then you're going to add second, and then because of the encapsulation of both of these things, you can more or less treat these as if they were in a parentheses and do the square rooting last. All right. Anyhow, uh, what do you get? If you use your calculator, and I would, you know, um, start by clearing out whatever mess is there. Be very anal about, not a lot of them. All right. Be very careful about how you arranged this half here of this equation when you're typing it, right? You want to make sure, that you can't rely on a calculator to know the order of operations. So if you take the time to write something this way, write it exactly as you see it here, right? Um, engage the square root, which is you would have to hit second first and then the uh, this upward pointing arrow button. And then you see it shows up there. Um, you know what, um, that's the generalization. So let me clear that, sorry. Uh, it's underneath here, so x squared, second, there you have it. And notice that the, it's like a function, so they put a parentheses here. Now, enter uh, the other guts here that you see. So 24 squared plus 18 squared, and then be a good sport and close the parentheses here. All right, and it should, sorry, it should be good to go, all right? So you have 30, which is cool. All right, you get a nice round number. Right. This uh, length of this ladder is 30 if it's feet. It's mentioned here and here that it has to be feet. It's one dimensional, right? Because it's a distance, it's a length, a diagonal length. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on. I like this question. This is about pizzas. <laughs> it's an indication of where my mind is at. Um. Um, to be strategic, what you might do is, once you've gotten through this, you'll realize that they're asking you to compare three things at once. Um, kind of reserve some space on a piece of paper uh, to do your work. So I'm going to do that now. And if you collimate, you can compare things side by side. It's a little. Um, unpleasant because of the break in the PDF file here, but let's read this first. All right. And I'll try to make here some distinction with the uh, color here. Right. Victoria wishes to order a large cheese pizza. She can choose among three uh, pizza parlors in town. Antonio's, Steve's, Dorsey's. Before we go any further, let's call this Antonio. 
Anthony. Right. Steve's. And Dorsey's. Which, uh, mm, I'm gonna use black because I can't trust green. Dorsey. Alright, and, and then they will describe the conditions of each. Antonio's large cheese pizza is round, and I'm assuming that it's circular pizza. Then. Right. So, uh, uh, just up here temporarily, I'll put it circle. Right. Um, and it's 16 inches in diameter. 16 inch pizza. That sells for $12. No, I'm reading it wrong. Uh, $15. Uh, hopefully that's not too faint. I'm trying to always manipulate the light to make it easy to read. Steve's large cheese pizza is also a round pie, but it's a little bit smaller. It's 14 inches, so again, just temporarily I'll put this here. Diameter is across the center, so it's 14 inches, and in this case it's slightly cheaper. Right, so 12 inches, not uh, $12. Dorsey's is a square, so it's a Sicilian pie of 12 inches by 12 inches. And 12 by 12. And um, that sells for $10. Now, if you just wanted to uh, basically not spend more than $10, then you're gonna go there uh, to Dorsey's, but um, that doesn't mean you're getting a good deal, all right? All three pizzas have the same thickness, so you don't have to consider the volume of them, all right? To get the most bang for her buck, all right? From which pizza parlor should Victoria order her pizza, all right? What you need to do here is to basically um, convert these each to a unit rate, right? which means that you have a, a basis of comparison that's consistent. Uh, a cost per one, uh, in this case, the inch squared. You know? It's not a fair comparison as they are, but you're gonna make it a fair comparison. Right? You're gonna translate these each to areas and then you're going to convert the area. You're going to convert area into a unit rate, which is an amount of money over one square inch. Right? If the denominators are all one square inch, right, and the dollar, the numerators are essentially whatever the dollar value is unique to each of these, then it is a fair comparison. As to which is the best rate, doesn't mean you're not. It doesn't mean you're going to save money. It just means that, at least not immediately, you know. It just means that you are going to get a better deal. Right. So this is a fair comparison. That's the whole point of this. You're making a fair comparison, and you can't do that initially. However, in each of these cases, based upon the shape of the pies, you have to use a different area formula. So let's calculate the area of Antonio's. Uh, his area is going to be a derivative of the uh, circle, uh, the area of the circle formula. So um, it would be pi times the radius squared. Yes, they gave you a diameter, so you have to you know, infer a little bit. Um, similarly, Steve, you're going to use the area of the circle formula. So it'll be pi times, again, the radius squared, or whatever you manipulate it to look like. And Dorsey is just going to be um, the area of the square, so you could use the square formula, which is side squared. That one's the easiest one, uh, immediately, because if it's a square, the dimensions are 12 by 12. They did explain that already. If you put that in here, 12 inches squared, that means that this area is 144 inches squared. Save that area, come back to it. These areas are gonna unfortunately incorporate an irrational number known as pi, as sacred as it is. So you're gonna end up having to round at one point. 
right? I would again try to reserve rounding for dead last. Hold off as long as you can, right? Because you get a better answer if you do that, all right? Um, in the case of Steve's pie, right, it's of course a diameter of 14 inches. Now, as long as you know what the concept of a diameter is, that it's half, it's the whole way across the center, so it's like a poker ball, you know, all right, then half of that would be seven inches, right? So you would insert a seven here, right? and it's technically inches. All right, now, do follow the order of operations, right? You square before you multiply. But again, reserve um, using 3.14 or whatever equivalent to pi uh, for last, all right? So it might not be immediately satisfying, uh, but do this. You're gonna square seven, which means you're gonna get 49. And I'm just gonna keep the pi symbol attached to it for now, all right? And then write inches squared. Save this, because even though it is, again, it's not satisfying because we didn't use 3.14, that is exact, all right? As long as I maintain the symbol of pi, I have an exactitude, all right? That is a word, all right, um, if it is. Um, now, as for Antonio, similar situation. Um, a diameter goes across the center, so half of that necessary for this sake would be eight inches. So I would insert an eight in here, and again, square it before you multiply to follow the appropriate order of operations. We could just stick them at a half of the formula here. This would be 64 pi inches squared. Okay, save that. Again, not immediately satisfying. Yes, you can if you want to multiply by 3.14, use your calculator to whatever, 10, uh, 10 places of precision. Um, but I would resist that temptation for the sake of being exact as close as you can, or, uh, you know, as accurate as you can. Um, as precise as you can be. All right. Anyhow, um, now, the fair comparison again would be an amount of money over an area because it would be over one inch squared. A unit is whenever you have one in the denominator. denominator. So this value right, is going to have to be divided. I'm just gonna, for the sake of space, erase this for a moment. And this, as we did the work, and that. have an area here, I'm going to write the cost of Antonio's pie, $15, above the line here. $15. And I'm going to write the cost of Steve's pie above the line here, $12. And lastly, the cost of Dorsey Pie, uh, $10 above the line here. Right. And now I'm going to have the calculator do this. Divide 15 by this exact figure, or as close to exact as possible, 64 times pi. Right. And then I'm going to get a dollar value that is a unit cost, if you wanted to be very precise instead of saying a unit rate, which is a generalization of anything over one. This quotient, I'm going to translate to so much money over one inch squared. By dividing these two, I'm going to uh, adapt a cost over, again, a unit of one inch squared. Doing the actual division produces this. The quotient is always going to be the top here. All right, same thing here. An actual value over one inch squared. And again, then we're going to be able to compare them because of the consistent unit 
of one inch square. Right. So um, here's where we take out our calculator because we have a pie button, right? And we're going to rig it to do what we want very correct, very uh, precisely, as close to the exact answer as possible. So um, enter the dollar value first, 15, and then hit division. And then uh, use parentheses here to encapsulate the denominator. You don't want it to think that one factor is the denominator only. So just to circumvent any issue, pun intended, as we're talking about a circle here, um, use 64 times pi, times pi, and close the parentheses. This is going to give us a very, very, very precise answer because we didn't round yet. We're gonna get a decimal and then we're gonna round if at worst case scenario, all right? So this is gonna be equal to 0 0.074. It looks like a six if I'm reading it correctly, yep. Um, dollars, which is a little more than seven cents basically. And to keep it consistent, I'm gonna write this here. Zero of red, 0 0.0746 dot 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 there's something after it but it is expressed in the unit of dollars and since dollars is not a measured unit it's a counted unit we put it appropriately in the front save that for comparison sake. all right next one all right 12 divided by parentheses 49 times pi again you would enter it this way 12 first division then again, encapsulate the entire denominator, essentially. Don't put, don't type 3.14, as long as you have a scientific calculator, you have a pi button, and you could get a very high degree of precision. So 49 times pi gives you this, 0 0.077. Looks like a nine from this perspective. Yep, five, three, so-and-so. So again, it's, a, it's closer to eight cents in this case. I'm going to, again, just because I'm being twitty, all right, I'm going to write uh, three or four decimal places here. Zero point zero seven seven nine, whatever it is. Okay. And then the last one is easy because you don't need a pi button. Uh, 10 divided by that, you're just going to divide those two. And you see that you get this 0 0.069 4 into infinity, four repeats, it looks like. So, um, 0 0.069 4 repeating. Okay, so um, without having rounded anything, um, you have a very, very precise unit rate, unit cost, if again you want to refer to money. Um, rather than generalize, but for the sake of comparison. So you have something that is about seven cents, right? um, a little more than seven cents, or maybe just say it this way, a little more than seven cents, a lot more than seven cents, and less than seven cents. Right? If you compare um, even just to the hundredths place, right? Because that's where money, our system of money would basically cut off, right? right. We only have pennies as a unit. Um, you could look that far to the hundredths place, two decimal places, and already see that Dorsey's, even though it's a different shape, right? That's the best deal. Okay. It's cheapest in terms of actual upfront money, and it is in fact, according to the area that you're actually getting, the cheapest technically per square inch. Okay. They are very close, and maybe a person wouldn't bother to be like, yeah, that's eight cents, seven cents, and six cents different. Am I really going to worry too much? Um, no, ultimately you decide based upon you know what flavor you like, you know. Or, uh, what um, the consistency of the actual pie is really what you decide for me. But if you're just thinking about something purely from a practical standpoint, 
<clears throat> that's cheapest to begin with, and it also happens to be the best deal. Deal. Why? Because it is the least expensive unit rate. It's this is a, if you want to be really twitty, right? This is about seven cents per inch per square inch. Right? This is about eight. And this is about seven. If you round it. Right? But that's technically the cheapest. Because that's rounded and that's rounded down and that's rounded off. Okay? Uh, let's see. Let's do um, number four and number five. Uh, number four is um, that's funny. Why did I put that there? This picture is pertaining to example five, so it's out of order, really. Um, but let's look at number four first, okay? This is more straightforward than uh, example five because it's just talking about shapes per se. Right? Determine the shaded area. Right? In a situation like this, you have to think more like an artist would. If you've ever used a program like, um, um, I believe Photoshop would do it, but uh, I, I've used the, the, the program Inkscape. Right? They have features like this that will help you draw that you have one shape superimposed upon another and in the process you can delete out one or the other portions of it. Um, in this case, you know, what we're preserving is this much of the parallelogram really, what I'm uh, semi-coloring in here. Right. You do have to be able to recognize the shapes that you're working with, but if you determine the shaded area, just what is crossed out here, crossed hash, Think about it this way. Right? You're going to identify the shape or the shapes involved. Okay. Um, in this case, a parallelogram and a circle. And then if you just want the part that is in blue, um, subtract these. Subtract out the circle area. Okay. Now, some of the information I got dirt on my glasses. Um, some of the information is um, disguised. Right. Remember the formula for a parallelogram, an area of a parallelogram, is base times height. Right. We evidently have the base immediately. It's ten. Right. So I would put a ten place of that. We can determine what the height is though by sort of rotating this dimension of a radius apparently and doubling it because the radius would be here and also there, right, if you just rotate it downward, right. So think about it as a diameter instead of a radius, right. The diameter would be two times two. So it'll be four, this is feet and this is feet, which makes this 40 feet squared, all right? Just the entire parallelogram, the entire thing, all right? That is without taking the whole into consideration. Now, when you get the formula for an area of a circle, all right, remember that the area formula of a circle is pi times the radius squared. Um, again, resist the temptation to use 3.14 immediately. They do tell you 
uh, use the key on your calculator and round your answer to the nearest hundredth, but do that last. All right? You get a better answer if you do. All right. Um, the radius is two. Coincidentally, you're going to get a four because right? you're squaring. All right. Um, what you might write this as is in terms of pi initially rather than a decimal. Just setting it up. So you have 4 pi. And if the unit is feet, then it's feet. So feet squared. Save that. What you want to do is enter this figure, 40, into your calculator. Then hit the subtraction symbol. Essentially type this. Enter this. 40 minus and just to make it very clear, you probably can get away with not using parentheses in this case, but I would anyway. Um, just, it's safer. Four times pi, all right? If you, again, resist the temptation to use 3.14 here, and you, you're not rounding intermittently, you could get the calculator to give you a very, very precise answer, and then round it last. That's a better answer. So, you know, um, what's the word? It's um, Delay gratification, right? So um, enter this like you see it here. And right, then we'll round it, all right, as an afterthought. All right, here's 40 minus the parentheses as are superfluous, but they're still uh, helpful, all right? The reason I like the parentheses is in this case is that they're sort of emphasizing that this is a different shape entirely, all right? You don't want it to um, basically uh, do things in an inappropriate order, and you can't really rely on a calculator to know the order of operations. So be, be extra anal retentive, All right? Now, this minus that gives you this, 27.43, um, three. Right. If this is what you get as a result of using a very precise uh, form of pi, um, blue area only 27.4336 whatever it is feet squared because we're talking about an area now we can follow the instruction round your answer to the nearest hundredth right. where is the hundredth place we have this three is sitting, right? So based upon the three adjacent to it, we will decide, do we keep that three and knock off infinity, or do we go round up, all right? In this case, it would be appropriate to round down, which is knocking off infinity here. So you have 27.43 feet squared. Okay. Um, let me read this first in example five, and then I'm going to go back to the diagram because it's very useful. That is a fault. I'm sorry, it's not a sequence. I guess I'll go for again. Applying lawn fertilizer, um, Alte plans to fertilize his lawn. The shapes and dimensions of his lot, this is grass basically, um, his house, driveway, pool, and rose garden are shown in the figure above 8.3, one pig, whatever. Uh, one bag of fertilizer cost $29.95. Here again, it uh, would be good to write this information for your own sake because it's a conversion factor. So I'm going to write this just out of the view of the projection. Right. One bag of fertilizer costs $29.95. So you could say that it equals 
all intents and purposes, $29.95. And simultaneously, it covers uh, 5,000 square feet. Now, when you end up incorporating this as part of your calculation, remember, you could group these two together. You, know, you could group these two together, or you could group these two together right, at will. As long as you have two parts to form a ratio, you're fine. All right. Determine how many bags of fertilizer at Alte, sorry, I'm going to call them Adelaide, Alte needs in the total cost. Number of bags. This first part and the total cost. This is the second part. Okay. Assume only full bags may be purchased. Only full. Can't have a fraction of a bag, even if that is correct, technically. All right, now, um, having dissected the information that is imperative here, let's go back to this illustration. This is, um, is the property itself. Right. Where <laughs> are we going to put fertilizer? Are you gonna put fertilizer in the pool? No, that would be a terrible swim, right? <laughs> You're not gonna put it in your house, hopefully. And if you put it on your driveway, then you can't park there. Um, arguably, one could put it in the rose garden. Um, um, let's see. That would be the most appropriate place, right? But it says that he just wants to fertilize his lawn. So one has to assume it's the green portions of this illustration that, w that we need to figure out. We want to know the area, uh, appropriately written in green here. Is that visible? I think it is. All right. Need to know the area in green only. Right. Which means what? It means that we have to figure out um, a couple of things. We need the total green. rectangle, or what would be the total green rectangle, and then we need to subtract a sum of other areas to get green only. The green with the void of the pool, the void of the house, void of the driveway, and void of the rose door. A sum of the other areas, and that's why since I'm talking about a sum, it implies that it's several things added. I'm going to encapsulate them in parentheses like this temporarily. All right. Some of these, because of the shape, you can get them right away. Um, let's figure out the area of the pool and just maybe superimpose it here. All right. If this is a rectangle, and one would assume a pool is, right? It's 20 times 30 for area, length times width. So two times three is six, with two zeros is 600 feet squared. Okay. Similarly, a house um, is an area that is a length times a width, and it's 60, although I wrote it in a dumb place, times 40. So it's six times four is 24, with two zeros is 2,400 feet squared. A driveway is another rectangle, right? A length times a width, because it's a rectangle. So four times 16 is, let's see, uh, 24, 64? Yep, 64. Okay, so 64 feet squared. Save that figure, all right, and these two. 2,464. All right, and then there's the rose garden, which is evidently a nice circular, so probably gazebo or something like that there. Um, if it does actually have a canopy, I don't know. Um, 
It's a circular shape, but they're giving you a dimension that is um, a diameter, apparently. So, red, um, this is going to be pi times radius squared. Instead of using 24, we're going to use half of 24, which would be pi times 12 squared. And you must square first. So, therefore, it is 144 pi. Again, as much as that is unsatisfying, resist the temptation to use 3.14, at least initially. All right, I hope that's not too hard to see, so maybe I'll just make it a little bit bigger. 144 pi. All right. All right. These things we need to add together eventually. Now, if you calculate what is the imaginary green rectangle in its entirety, that is without the, the voids, Right, what would you get in a case like that? Let's call that the total green. Right? It is 150 feet by 180 feet. Right? So what's well, 150 times uh, 180? Uh, 15 times 2 uh, is uh, 30. 27,000, something like that? Sounds familiar. Yeah. Let me cheat for a moment. Because I'm feeling a little extra foggy for a moment. 15 times, no. 50 times 180. Yeah, 27,000, good guess. Okay. Um, so there we have it. Alright. So, the total green is. I'll put it in here, um, 27,000 feet squared. It's the comprehensive law in here. So, the green without the voids, 27,000 feet squared. And now we have to calculate the sum here. What would this sum consist of? It would consist of 600 plus 2400 plus 64 plus 144 pi. All right, all feet squared. It is appropriate to subtract this eventually because you have area minus area. All right, now again, just for the sake of a very, very uh, accurate, close to the exact answer question. Uh, answer. Um, let us type this. Type 2700 into your calculator. Twenty-seven thousand rather minus parentheses six hundred plus twenty-four hundred twenty-four thousand rather uh, twenty-four hundred plus sixty-four plus one hundred forty-four pi. Notice that I'm putting pi at the tail end here because I don't want to round intermittently. Right, so I'm, I'm rigging the situation so that I can avoid doing that. Right, this is more or less how you will enter it. 27,000 minus the sum of six parentheses, make sure you include that, 624, 144 pi. Right. Uh, and that will just give us the area so that, clear, 27,000 minus parentheses, 600 plus 2400 plus 64, oh, oh pardon me, 640, right, yeah, because there's a zero here, right, so 640, that'll be a dodo, 640, 640. 640 plus 144 pi, close parentheses. All right, uh, just to show you, this is the end of it. If I scroll backward, you see the other add ends and then the other subterrand. Okay. 
So 27,000 minus 600 plus everything encapsulated here. All right, enter. And there you have it. This is the area that would be left over if you suck out the pool, suck out the house, the driveway, and the rose garden. All right, 22,000. Uh, 907.61, something like that. Keep it on your screen. Okay. I'm going to just clear up the gobbledygook a little bit here. Make it easier to see what's unfurling. We calculated this. Um, the area that is important is twenty-two thousand nine hundred seven point six one zero six. That's as far as it is on our screen, at least. And I'm not rounding anything yet. Okay. I'm just leaving it on my calculator screen. All right now, the number of bags. All right to answer the first part of this question. would employ um, this ratio of a bag to an area. Right, remember that uh, feet squared is an area and we have an area. This is feet squared as well. Right. Sorry. If I write a conversion factor that incorporates these two chunks of the relationship here, then multiplying this times that conversion factor of 5,000 feet squared down here strategically and one bag up here strategically, this will cross cancel by design, leave me with this figure times one, which is the same thing without changing it. Uh, over 5,000, which means, again, without having uh, touched your calculator, you just have to divide by 5,000, you see, is the, the answer. So I'll divide by 5,000, and get that. 4.58 such and such. Okay, so this is eggs. 4.58, whatever it is, 81, blah, blah, blah. And the question was that you can only purchase naturally full bags. So you'll, you're not gonna buy four bags, you're not gonna have enough. Right? And you can't get a fraction of a bag. So what do you round it to? You have no choice at this point to round it to five bags. That's how many per the owl tape would need. So we've answered the first question, the first part of this number of bags, you have no choice but to get fine. Now, if you're trying to figure out how much would it actually cost, yes, you're gonna get stuck with some leftover fertilizer, but so be it. More for the rows going. All right. um, now, go back to the conversion factor relationships here and borrow again two of these. So you would need in an instance like this, Uh, different things. You need bags and an amount of money. So, rigging this to cross cancel bags, you would put bags down here, and the dollar value, although it might be counterintuitive to you, you put dollars always in the front because it's not a measurement, it's something that's counted. It's 29.95 per one. This will strategically cancel the unit of bags, even if that seems silly. You have denominators of one, which are totally superfluous, and it's really just a matter of doing five times 29.95. Five times 29.95, which would be, um, 149.75. Don't tell you to round anything else, right? I don't think so, okay? 
so that's cool, right? Um, the last couple of things, let's look at example six. And seven, respectively. Um, what you have to do? Convert uh, between square feet and square inches. Okay. Uh, this is a good situation where you would draw um, a picture to help answer. That's a good habit in general, but especially for problems like this, right? Because you're converting from um, one-dimensional units ultimately to two-dimensional units and you have to be careful so um, let's start with this I'm gonna reiterate uh, question a in a more concise fashion right? so if it's one foot squared and you're trying to convert it you want to know essentially well what does that equal to square inches right and in that regard right draw a little square and give it some dimensions, right? If it's a square foot, and you know an area, which is what it would have to be, is a length times a width, or a side times a side, if we're talking about a square technically, then it would have a dimension of one this way, and a dimension of one this way. That's one foot times one foot, would have to be, all right? Because it's two things multiplied, and if it's the amount of one here, it would have to be one times one. All right. Translate this individual dimension into um, inches, because there, you know that you can. As an American, you're probably used to the fact that one foot is 12 inches. So this would be the same thing here. One foot is 12 inches. All right. Now, if you perform the same multiplication, one times one is one in feet, you know, if you do it in inches times inches, you'll get the equivalent of square inches, right? 12 times 12 is what? 144. Okay. Similarly, here's B. Convert 37 feet squared to square inches. Um, 37 feet squared is equal to how many square inches? You don't have to struggle in this case because you've already produced a conversion factor. This becomes a conversion factor for this problem. Right? You have the unit ratio. So, um, in this case, maybe start with the model. Yeah. If you're given 37 feet squared, and you strategically multiply um, to cross cancel feet squared and end up with inches, right? Then you could borrow again this conversion factor right? of one foot squared is 144 inches squared. And in that instance, this cancels this, and it's a matter of multiplying three times 144. Which is 5,328, it looks like. So 37 times 144, yes. This will be 5,328 inches squared. Okay, C. Now you're going to go backwards in this case, but again, you already have the conversion factor because you derived it. Um, if you are given, essentially, part C here, sorry, I'm going to lose my markers, 432 inches squared, and you strategically rig it to cross-cancel inches squared, 
that will require you to put inches squared down here and uh, square feet up here. Right. The conversion relationship is one foot is 144 square inches. And then why? Because we're talking about areas rather than one dimensional units. So this cancels this. If you treat it like fractions, it's top times top and bottom times bottom. And what you end up with is 432 above the line and 144 below the line. And you have the unit that you want to go. Right? You would use a calculator to get a very crystal clear answer here, 432 divided by 144 and get exactly three. This is three feet squared. Yo -ho. Okay. Not too bad, right? Again, as a good strategy to summarize, make conversion factors, right? How do you do that in this case and in subsequent cases? Draw a picture, right? If you end up having to draw a square or what have you, all right, the information is staring you right in the face. And sometimes you just don't see it, all right? But draw a picture and then you could fill it in non-verbally. And go, all right, well, if this is a square, then the dimension here and here has to be the same. If the amount is one, then the only way that this can work out is one times one, all right? Then you could break up the individual parts into their equivalents and then multiply again, all right? It's a roundabout way of thinking. Um, all right. Let me clear this up as I can't really go any lower on my PDF file projection here. Right, let me read that. Uh, Rebecca wishes to purchase marble flooring uh, for her rectangular office floor which measures 27 by 23 feet, all right? It's a rectangular office floor. So again, start by mooring a rectangle. And the dimensions are The dimensions are 27 feet by 23 feet. The cost of the flooring, including installation, is $114 per square yard. Now, this is the conversion factor. This is not, uh, again, explicitly stated. I would write that information somewhere handy. $114 essentially equals um, one square yard. Right. That's in the style of an equation. Right? In the style of a ratio or conversion factor, you could either write it as 114 over one yard squared, or you could write it upside down, one yard squared over 114. That's the beauty of conversion factors, right? Because you can at will arrange them this way, or in this orientation, whatever is most conducive. Now to answer these two parts, determine the area of Rebecca's floor in square yards. Right now, there's a trick question, right? Because they're asking if they're in square yards. All right, but they gave you measurements of feet. You could, if you wanted to, convert each of these dimensions before you multiply, but I wouldn't. I would do it rather than do it twice. Do it once. So we're going to take this area. Recognize that we're dealing with a rectangle and that it's a matter of multiplying two things. Substitute the appropriate dimensions here and here, 27 feet and 23 feet, and then spit out so many feet squared to start with. So what is 27 times 23? Yeah, I got a logarithm. 621. This is 621 feet squared. Again, even our conversion factor incorporates square yards. So what we're going to need to do is borrow 
an appropriate conversion factor, which is available, to cancel out units of feet squared and leave us with units of yards squared so that we get so many yards squared instead. Answer this part A. Okay. Um, in that event, draw a little picture to help summarize. Here is a square yard. A square yard would in theory be one yard this way times one yard this way. How many feet are in a yard? One yard, one dimension, is three feet. And the other one would be the same thing. Three feet. So, you know that a square yard produces an area naturally, and therefore it would be this times this, one times one. What if instead of yards you use the one dimensional unit of three feet by three feet? Then you get what? You'd see that one yard squared is equal to nine feet squared. In this instance, we're talking about one dimension to one dimension. In this case, we're talking about two dimensions to two dimensions. We're on the picture, you can help pluck out the necessary information. So, appropriately, nine would go here and one would go here. And then we could get the satisfaction of crossing out these units that are diagonal here and then treat them like fractions. 621 above the line and 9 below the line. So you're going to use your calculator to divide by 9 and you get 69 exactly. All right. The area is equal to 69 yards squared. Save that because that's just part A. Okay. Now, to determine the cost of the marble flooring, we're going to incorporate this conversion factor oriented like so or like so. All right. um, if you want to get a dollar value, we need dollars on top, so we're going to borrow this one. All right. That means that 69 yards squared, you can put it over one if you like, times the appropriate conversion factor is going to give me an amount of money. Conversion factor oriented appropriately would be this one. 114 over one yard squared. And that's visible. This strategically cancels this. You're left with the ones in the bottom of superfluous at 69 times 114. And a lot of times when you do problems like this, if you're very strategic, which you only get in the long run, you don't have you go to your calculator and you don't have to do much. Um, $7,866 is what it's going to cost Rebecca. Poor Rebecca. That's a hefty price. <laughs> this marble. All right. All right. So that looks like we've done good. All right. Let me turn this off. And I'll say goodbye. Um... For homework, again, if you've been consistently following the schedule as outlined in Canvas, for homework, um, do section uh, 8.3 in my lab. And everything is good. All is well in that world. Okay. Right. Thank you, guys. I'll see you again tomorrow. Be careful out there.